evening, and thank you to General Manager Bob Lasher, Superintendent Dr. John Flair, uh, John, John Doherty, members of the Reading School Committee, um, town and school staff, town meeting members, my colleagues on the, bo on the board, neighbors in the hall, and those watching at home in RCTV, and um, in homage to bring your family to work day, my wife and my son um, in the front row. It's my honor to deliver the first ever State of the Town Address as Chair of the Reading Select Board. Before I summarize the events of the past year and outline the challenges and opportunities for this coming year, I want to recognize some new and returning faces to our town government family. Um, congratulations, if, and if you're here, um, I know many of you are town meeting members, if you're here, just either stand up or raise your hand. Um, but congratulations to Andrew Grimes and Alice Collins, who return as library trustees. Um, congratulations also to Dave Hennessy and John Stempeck, uh, who will continue to serve on the light board, and Elaine Webb, who returns uh, to the school committee. And how can we forget you, Mr. Moderator? Um, there's a whole entire generation in Reading who've never known anyone else but Alan Folds as the town meeting moderator. Um, we're also blessed to welcome the energy and talents of those elected for the first time. Manette Verrier will join the library trustees, and Sherry Vandenacker, who was appointed in the middle of uh, this past budget session to replace Dr. Gary Nyan, was elected in her own right and will take her seat on the school committee. I also want to welcome a new colleague to my board, Vanessa Alvarado. Vanessa can't be here tonight. She had a long-standing um, family commitment, so now I get to actually do this without her here, which is a lot more fun. <laughs> um, besides bringing down significantly the average age of this board, uh, Vanessa brings a unique perspective to the select board. She has a keen intellect and a firm understanding of the budget from her years of service on FinCom, and she represents a segment of volunteers in this town um, who basically um, do school drop-off, hop on the train, go to work, come home, make dinner, and then go to the meeting. That's a valuable uh, perspective to have. But more importantly, she listens, she asks questions, and she's open-minded. It's a valuable skill set, and I'm confident she'll make us better. I'm delighted to be a, a colleague of hers, and I want to welcome Vanessa Alvarado. So thank you. And finally, I want to welcome the new members of this body, town meeting. Whether you were here the old-fashioned way by walking around and getting 10 people to sign a, peti you know, a petition, or you got on stickers or a writing campaign, um, you, um, we're thrilled that you're here, and I, I hope you know what you signed up for. So I know you guys got sworn in last time, but for those new town meeting members, please stand up and be recognized by the body. <laughs> Don't hate me on the way out. Uh, and to all the women and men who've agreed to serve, I say a heartfelt thank you from a grateful town. Your neighbors have entrusted you to act in good faith and to work diligently for the best interests of the town. I'm confident you'll do just that. And while we welcome new and returning colleagues, I think it's very important that we also acknowledge and thank an old friend. Let me take a moment to say a special thank you to John Arena, who graced this board for two terms. I serve with John both on the Selectmen and on the Finance Committee. He has served this town with distinction for many years in a myriad of volunteer services, not just in town government, as a coach, um, church volunteer, a variety of different um, opportunities. He has a first-rate intellect and his ability to synthesize complex data into understandable nuggets was an incredibly valuable attribute to have on this board. We all owe John a, a debt of gratitude. No one should doubt his commitment or his love for the town of Reading. I don't see him here tonight, but I think we should send him some congratulations. Thank you, John. <laughs> Friends, I started thinking of, about giving this address three weeks ago. If I had to write it then and describe then the state of the town in one word, I would say we were fatigued. This has been a grueling and long 12 to 18 months. Both overrides and the corresponding budget cycles were exhausting endeavors that dominated the, poli the body politic really since the summer of 2016. It's been almost two full years. Um, but there's other things. We endured a major fire, which left dozens of our neighbors homeless, 
Um, we endured two bomb threats and a natural uh, gas failure which left dozens with no heat on the coldest nights of the year. We have to say a special thanks to our DPW and our law enforcement um, and our um, public safety folks for really enduring that. So please, thank you. And the recent proliferation of racist and anti-Semitic graffiti has challenged us to engage in community-wide discussions as we ponder proper responses and question what it means to be an open and welcoming community. These are all some of the things that we had to deal with. But after some much-needed rest, contemplation, I stand before you tonight re-energized and never more confident in our ability to ensure not only our fiscal stability, but our civic pride as a town that's the envy of all who observe. Some may think that the passage of the override was the only significant issue we undertook this year. It certainly seemed like it, especially over the last four months. But we were busy elsewhere. We implemented the first year of senior tax relief. 182 households received, on average, a 30 percent reduction to their property tax bill. This was paid for by other homeowners and owners of commercial property. We didn't forego the revenue, we just passed it on to our neighbors. We expect participation to increase next year as the word gets out. We remain committed to do all we can to allow those seniors who help build this town age in place if they so choose. We completed our housing production plan. We'll continue to strive to reach our legal and moral obligation of 10% affordability of our housing stock. No less than five large projects have moved through the permitting stage through CPTC and ZBA and are ready to put shovels in the ground this year. In fact, one already has. Our efforts have been rewarded by the state as we've been given a safe harbor from, 40B, from future 40B developments until February of 2019. Only a handful of other towns in the Commonwealth have been granted such a waiver. This allows us to control the scope, design, implementation, um, and uh, of high-density housing and increase our leverage over developers who want to build here. It's an important document. In October, we hosted an economic development summit at the library with Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, Jay Ash, as the featured speaker. There we introduced Reading to the development community and let the world know, in no uncertain terms, that Reading was open for business. Over 75 people attended, including a number of developers, as we showcased the town as a worthy place to invest. We completed our emergency management training and building security study. As you know from recent events, we can never prepare a train enough. Building security will be an ongoing topic going forward. The schools will be hosting a community-wide school safety forum on May 23rd, and building security will be a major part of our capital budget going forward. We've completed a good chunk of revamping the selectmen's operating policies. This is important as the public has a right to expect from its highest elected board predictable and transparent operations, especially in the wake of what some have called a trust gap. So let's talk about the override for a second. What will it do? What won't it do? And, what, and more importantly, what did we learn? You, the, vet, the, red, the voters of Reading, underwent an intense number of months of digesting data, attending community meetings, reading and writing millions of social media posts, letters to the editor, speaking, cajoling, persuading, yelling, arguing with your neighbors. Um, and we undertook individual and collective soul searching about what's the kind of town that we want to live in. We came out in record numbers for a municipal election, 43%, and overwhelmingly decided to invest in our town and our schools and ourselves. While relieved, we must be mindful and respectful of our neighbors who did not vote in favor. Living among us are folks who struggle with this extra burden. We need to make sure that we help those who need it most. We're all now familiar with what the passage of the override will help us achieve. Um, if, you, if you don't remember, I'm sure many of you got in your door, maybe one or three or five times, these flyers that tell you exactly what the override's going to do. Um, but we're also this evening in the budget presentations, we're going to hear more in great detail. Now that our fiscal health and ability to deliver basic services is assured for the next few years, um, the town and the schools can focus on a more robust agenda for the future. The tenor of this meeting and this address would be so much different without your efforts, and I thank you. While we've all breathed a, a collective sigh of relief, the passage of the override is not a panacea. The town is not all of a sudden flush with cash. As you recall, the town manager and the superintendent together 
proposed level service budgets that required about $5 million of additions. These did not include nice-to-haves, or wouldn't it be nice if we had. Um, it included only what, in their minds, uh, what was needed to get us to level service. At a marathon meeting on January 30th, we settled on $4.15 million as the figure that accomplished the most with the best chance of passing. The need for future operating overrides is still here. Nothing about the results on April 3rd makes the annual challenges and structural deficits inherent in Proposition 2 and a half disappear. When revenue is capped and costs are not, at some point, the reset button needs to be hit if you want to avoid drastic cuts. That has not changed. Our budgets will always be stressed. It's important that we set these expectations. There are many lessons learned from this endeavor that I believe will have a lasting impact on how government operates in Reading, not only on future override ballot initiatives, but on all key decisions facing the town in the future. Here are three. One, don't assume, ask. During override one, we perhaps made decisions in a bubble. After hearing loud and clear that we did it wrong, we went back and asked, so what did we do wrong? The Selectman survey was a critical component in getting us to yes in, in April. There, 2,200 respondents laid out the blueprint for success. In it, you told us what we needed to do to turn the necessary number of no voters into yes voters. You said, make it smaller. Show us where the money's going. Show us where you cut, and tell us about the other revenue. You told us, and we listened. We also endured some pointed and perhaps deserved feedback in the comments section. Hundreds of pages and probably over a thousand comments. You did not hold back. Stinging? Um, probably. Necessary? Absolutely. We needed to hear what you said. Number two, an engaged community is a better community. It's not surprising to me that 43% of the electorate turned out for this vote. People have never stopped caring about the town they live in, but most times they were satisfied to relegate the decision making to others. But when a neighbor knocks on your door, or invites you to a coffee, or engages you at the soccer field, or calls you at home, you'll listen more. We, as the elected officials, have a limited reach. You, the citizens, are, more, are far more adept at telling the story making the case and reaching your neighbors. You were clearly invested. Number three, don't make assumptions about your neighbors. Perhaps during override one, assumptions may have been made by the voters and basically by us too. Only the elderly vote. Or only folks with kids, uh, with school-aged children care about the schools. If you voted no, you were selfish. If you voted yes, you just are your newcomers that want to chase us old-timers out. There's more. I've heard them all. So did you. But the biggest takeaway for me as an elected official is that I firmly believe that when you lay bare all the facts on the table for everyone to see, uncover all the numbers, tell the whole story, even if you know it's something that people don't want to hear or it's something that's going to make them angry, people will make the right decisions. It's not for us up here to tell you what type of town government you should have or that you deserve. Waiting 15 years to pass an override because we were fearful of the outcome has had devastated and long-lasting consequences. We've all heard the term trust gap. Maybe part of the gap is that we didn't trust you enough to make the right decisions. Hopefully, in this campaign, we've learned fundamentally to change the way town government interacts with you and the way you interact with town government. So what now? Um, there are a slew of issues coming before us in the next month which will require action and attention. Among these are meeting with the Housing Authority to discuss preserving the affordable housing that we already have. We're going to work with the Board of Health on a pesticides policy. We're going to review and adopt townwide personnel policies, discuss a public process for Oakland, the Oakland Road property, continue contract negotiations with Comcast and Verizon who provide our cable TV. We're going to establish a new master plan. Um, and town manager goals for the next year, as well as finalizing plans for the water tower. But I want to focus on a couple of major issues which are probably going to take up most of, our, um, uh, most of our attention. One is economic development and new growth. Expansion of the 40R Smart District to include much of the downtown has, has and will continue to have a profound impact 
on the face of downtown and the health of our downtown business community. I want to pay a special <clears throat> thank you to Assistant Manager Jean, Del Jean Delios, her staff and the volunteer boards for years of planning and now overseeing five major projects that will break ground in the downtown in the next 12 to 18 months. There's the post Postmark Square 40R, Gould Street 40R, the Sunoco 40R, in addition to the 40B at Lincoln Street, which is already broken ground, and the 40B reuse at St. Agnes. Collectively, this is over $100 million of private investment that will create over 200 new households, all within walking distance of the downtown commuter rail. That's 200 new customers for Nick's Dry Cleaners, 200 new birthday cards for the Hitching Post, 200 bottles of wine for Pomplamoose, watch Chief, um, and Professor's Market will do a booming takeout business. Also, new wayfinding signs, which culminated from a grant uh, Community Development Director Julie Mercier uh, wrote, will help create a sense of place and arrival and make the businesses at Maine and Haven a destination rather than something you zoom past on your way to Stoneham or North Reading. All the 40R projects will also include commercial and retail space, including restaurants and outdoor seating, giving life during the day to downtown when most of us leave town to go to work. The Sunoco project will also add three parking spaces. So I want to take a second and kind of you can give you a, a new a tour. You don't have to leave your seats of what you will come to see. This is the new post office. Well, it's the old post office, but it's the new development, Postmark Square. In it, you can see that, we, that they're going to keep the facade and what you see is Haven and, and Sanborn, where there's going to be new commercial space and 50 units of ownership housing will be stepped out from the side with underground parking. Um, it'll be a project that um, when you walk by it, you won't be able to see the massive density, um, but there'll be 50 uni new units of home ownership there. This is the new Gould Street project, or what was EMARC. I think 60 units, 55? 55 units of, of rental housing all, and com new commercial space um, along Gould Street um, a, a, as you kind of go from Haven in, into Gould. Also parking underground. This is 467 Main Street or the Sunoco station. What's great about this project is that it brings the building up to the street level. Right now that's where the Sunoco is. It is just one large curb cut with just vacant space in front. It will bring commercial space up front and housing behind it. That's the corner of Main and Green. Um, we're also going to create outdoor seating and potentially some restaurants. If you kind of go this way, um, what, you're gonna see, what comes there is Professor's Market um, and Dan Dewar's um, convenience store. Uh, and, the, and the spot on the left is going to be three new uh, part of parking spaces. So it's going to basically bring the walkability of downtown further away. This is Lincoln Street, uh, 40B, our favorite project. You all know about that. I don't need to go into much more detail. But look where it is, right by the railroad tracks. And then this is Schoolhouse Commons, or the St. Agnes reuse. It's really technically not downtown, but there'll be 20 units of housing there um, with parking, a really kind of a, a very, very short walk to downtown. So while it's not technically in the downtown, I sort of include that in our, in our reuse. I talked earlier about the wayfinding signs. So right now, Redding, downtown Reading is like Oakland. There's no there there. You don't know you're there until you pass it. Well, um, thanks to Julie's hard work, we got a very, very rare grant to work with a designer and an, ar an architect on just sort of branding what our downtown is going to be. And this is sort of this and some of the other signs will direct people to parking, will let people know that they've arrived at this destination. It's really going to make Maine and Haven really the focus of our downtown. Notice that the colors are not red and black. Notice that it's not a rocket, right? What we did was we wanted to sort of brand the town for what it is, for its historical purpose. The buildings on there represent the iconic buildings of Reading, Parker Tavern, Old South, the library, Town Hall, and those treatments are, are treated there with some pleasing colors that reminisce about the fall. Um, totally different and totally new. So this growth, while it's exciting 
um, and it does provide opportunities, will not come without its challenges. Um, the impacts of construction, as well as the presence of high density housing spilling into residential neighborhoods, need to be carefully managed. The select board is committing to making these new neighbors good neighbors. Similarly, we're committed to ensuring the 40B at Lakewood and Eaton is properly sized and that the neighbors' concerns and input are heard before the project is approved. We're also going to, I know everybody's thinking, where's the parking? We're going to engage in a downtown parking study, taking into account all these new housing units, and yes, it will include the depot and probably rethink that sticker. This new growth is imperative if we're going to increase the percentage of our commercial tax base, which is currently the lowest amongst our peer communities. We are dead last in what we raise in commercial tax revenue. It's also going to give the override some legs. Currently, we budget about $550,000 of new growth annually, annually. That new growth is basically you add a deck to your house, you tear down one small house and build another. It's the new assessed value. It's about $550,000 a year. Just with the known pipeline projects that we have, our new growth figure will approach a million dollars over the next few years. This will hopefully sustain the override you so generously voted. Not all of this growth is going to be net growth. There will be some added costs to service the new residents. Um, but it is very po net positive relative to what it could have been if we did single, housing single fam family housing. The lion's share of the new housing that's going to be created is one and two bedrooms. Um, and it's really going to be designed for millennials who are going to take the train into Boston. We're in the process of hiring our new economic development director to replace Andrew Corona, who left when his wife was transferred to a new job. Andrew left us in a very good place. Reading is now on the radar of the commu of communi for the development community. His re replacement will have as task one coordinating all the moving pieces of a potential DPW garage project. The last topic I want to touch on on this address is not the what, but the how, and really defines the essence of how we should operate a modern day local government. Broadly speaking, I call this volunteerism, collaboration, and civic discourse. In my travels, I'm often approached by citizens who say, the town should do more of this, or the town should do less of that. What's the town? Who's the town? If you look up at this podium, there's maybe 15, 20 odd people sitting here, and only two draw a salary from the taxpayers. The town is you, and the town is me. Reading has always enjoyed a robust volunteer spirit. There are over 40 volunteer boards or commissions, consisting of over 150 volunteers appointed just by our board. There are countless other volunteer organizations working for the benefit of the town, from Friends of the Reading Library to Friends of Reading Recreation, who we gave a special award to last month to folks who work with the senior center delivering meals to folks who do their taxes, who go shopping for them. There's even a new organization called Arts Reading, which is dedicated to creating a cultural district in the downtown. All of these are exciting and important and valuable uh, um, volunteer efforts. One of the benefits of the override campaign that, that, that I saw is that it uncovered a new generation of leaders, many of whom got involved in, t in the town for the first time. The mom I canvassed with is also an investment banker. The retiree holding a sign was a, a retired exec from an engineering firm. The point is, is that, there are, that are, there are really talented and invested people living in town who've never been asked. And we're going to need all of you. You, didn't, you don't need an advanced degree, just a commitment and a love of service. I'm asking you to consider putting your skills and your commitment to work as we look to fill the myriad of positions on town boards and also look to the, also the outside organizations that are always looking for volunteers. The issues we face in town are complicated and many of our resources are limited. Driving to Boston Saturday night for dinner, I counted no less than 15 construction cranes from the Zakem Bridge to the seaport. Business is booming in Boston as we enter the eighth year of an economic recovery, but our partners in the federal and state government have not shared the largesse. Reading's share of the governor's local aid budget increased by a scant 1.8 percent. While I would welcome with open arms Betsy DeVos or Charlie Baker coming through the back door to join us tonight, I would like it a whole lot better if they brought a check. Not likely. For better or for worse, folks, we're on our own. It means we have to do things differently now. Boards and committees used to working in silos are going to have to come together. And I give you a couple of examples. We all know the Senior Center and the Killam School need either massive renovations or to be totally rebuilt. 
will be challenged to do both of them. But is a possible solution one multi-generational facility that serves both populations? If so, the select board and the school committee will need to work together like they never have before. Imagine a campaign where the seniors and the parents of school-age children work hand in hand on the same project. We're all grateful to the RMLD, not only for the reliable, low-cost energy delivered in a customer-friendly way, but also for the $2.5 million dividend it pay, pays to the town each year. But we heard Monday night from my colleague Dan Ensminger and RMLD Chair Phil Pacino that in the age of conservation, RMLD is selling less power. Their fixed costs, meanwhile, are, are increasing. How, for example, can the select board and the RMLD work together to assist RMLD develop other sources of revenue? thus not only protecting our dividend, but enhancing our economic development efforts as a town with the lowest electric rates in the region. How can the library leverage that beautiful new building um, and work with all the other different boards and committees and, in town to really get people to come there and to do things that maybe haven't been done before? I think you get my point. To thrive, we're going to have to do business differently. We must pay more than lip service to the notion of working together. We're going to have to think out of the box. The select board has no monopoly on how to get this done, trust me. The ideas window is now open. We'll work with each and all of you to come up with innovative and creative ways to move ahead. I know there's tremendous talent and commitment within the 01867. Please come forward and apply for one of those many open positions that we're going to advertise shortly or join one of the other dozens of civic groups working in town. If you don't know exactly what you want to apply for, just send the resume. We'll find a place for you. Some people have suggested that maybe our local civic discourse has deteriorated over the last couple of election cycles, and that maybe we've devolved into factions. I don't know, maybe that's true, but I don't think that's who we are. I believe all of us have the best interest of the town of Reading in our hearts and our minds. Maybe we don't trust our neighbors have that, but I know we all do. The override showed us that people who don't always agree will work together on a project that is in the best interest of the town of Reading. If we get people working together, trust will slowly build and we'll be better for it. And to quote President Kennedy, he said, civility is not a weakness. In the meantime, put down your devices, talk to your neighbors face to face. You'll find that you actually have a lot in common. Thank you all very much for your love and commitment to the town of Reading. I am tremendously proud and excited about what lays ahead for us. So let's stop talking and get to work. Thank you.